the 1960 election. In January 1960, Kennedy declared himself a candidate for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. He outmaneuvered his older and more experienced rivals, including Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas, the powerful Senate Majority Leader, and won the nomination. The Republicans nominated former Senator Richard Nixon of California, who had, for the past seven years, served as Vice President of the United States under the popular President Dwight Eisenhower, the victorious Supreme Allied Commander during the Second World War. Kennedy and Nixon shared many similarities. Both had served as Navy officers in the war. Both had been elected to Congress in 1946 and then to the Senate. There they worked cordially with each other shared an interest in foreign affairs, and agreed on one of the great issues of the day, the danger posed by communism and the Soviet Union. But in another way, they could not have been more different. John Kennedy's family was rich, and he had enjoyed all the privileges that money could buy. A fine Harvard education, world travel, maternal possessions, leisure, and his father's contacts. John Kennedy never had and never would need to work for a living a day in his life. His father wanted to free his sons from that pressure so that they could pursue political careers. Richard Nixon, by contrast, came from a poor family and grew up without privilege. Whatever he had in life, a college education, a law degree, and a political office, he had to earn on his own with hard work and a keen mind. What John Kennedy was given, Richard Nixon had struggled to attain. In college, Kennedy was an indifferent student, but he developed a love of American and European history. As a junior congressman, he earned a reputation as a young playboy, unserious about his work. But by the time he captured the Democratic nomination, he had evolved into a mature leader who, like Nixon, was a voracious reader, a savvy politician, and a formidable debater. Both men possessed brilliant minds. The presidential election of 1960 turned out to be one of the closest in American history. Nixon entered the contest as the favorite. He possessed a track record of significant achievements, and the majority of voters respected his years of experience as President Eisenhower's vice president. One of the top issues of the day was preventing the spread of communism around the world and curbing the influence of America's rival superpower, the Soviet Union. And Richard Nixon had unsurpassed credentials as an anti-communist politician whose views were respected by the majority of Americans. The main, the main author of communism was the 19th century German philosopher Karl Marx, who believed that every individual must give way to the collective. Marx advocated the abolition of private property and organized religion, which he called the opiate of the people. The most sustained effort to put communism into practice began with the Russian Revolution of 1917 under the dictators Vladimir Lenin and later Joseph Stalin. Communists claimed that their philosophy, when put into practice, would serve the common good. It proved to be a naive dream that was soon corrupted. Millions of people who resisted communism in Russia and some 30 other countries throughout the 20th century were killed. More than 100 million victims in all. In pursuit of their goal, communists established totalitarian political regimes that flouted individual rights, banned freedom of speech, eliminated free elections, set up police states, corrupted the rule of law, and imprisoned and murdered opponents. World War II had ended with the defeat of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan by the Allies, who consisted of the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. With Germany and the Axis powers crushed, the Allies emerged as the great political powers of the post-war era. Of the Allied powers, only the Soviet Union was a communist nation and not a democracy. The end of the war resulted in a delicate balance of power a Cold War in which no shots were fired between the democratic nations and the Soviet Union. Former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill warned in a famous speech that an iron curtain now divided Europe into the free democratic nations in the West and the totalitarian communist nations in the East. Richard Nixon 
Richard Nixon owed his meteoric political career to his vigorous anti-communism at the height of the Cold War. But some Americans thought that Nixon had gone too far, and they associated him with what they believed were excesses committed at home by Senator Joseph McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee during their investigations of communists in the United States during the 1950s. John Kennedy, too, began the race for the presidency with some disadvantages. No Catholic had ever been elected president. In that era, a prejudice that does not exist today might have prevented a person of that faith from becoming president. Kennedy argued that he would not be a Catholic president, but merely a president who happened to be Catholic. He persuaded enough people that a person's religious beliefs should not bar him from the office. Kennedy's other disadvantage was his lack of expertise. Yes, he had served in the House and the Senate for 14 years when he began his race for the presidency, but he was not particularly accomplished as a legislator. Nixon's supporters portrayed Kennedy as a callow young man who was only 43 years old and who had not taken his time in Congress seriously. They argued that due to his lack of experience, he was unqualified to serve as president. Indeed, fellow Democrat Lyndon Johnson referred to Kennedy as a boy. Johnson believed that Kennedy should wait his turn until he was more mature and not challenge him now for the nomination. Kennedy disagreed. He believed in the power of fate and that his illness, injuries, and near-death experiences had marked him as a man who might be deprived of a long life. He was a man of action determined to make the most of his time and who wanted to accomplish things now. In a series of televised debates between the two parties' presidential candidates, the first in American history, Kennedy leveled the playing field as, a 70, as 70 million people watched. Nixon was famous as a relentless and ruthless debater, and many expected him to vanquish Kennedy. But before the evening of the first debate, Kennedy relaxed, shaved closely, and allowed stage makeup to be applied to his face. Nixon spent the day campaigning and had aggravated a painful leg injury. He showed up at the television studio with a day's growth of beard, a five o'clock shadow. He refused makeup. People who listened to the debate on the radio thought that Nixon had won. Those who watched it on television, however, thought that Kennedy had won. John Kennedy had a brilliant insight. He recognized that television would change political campaigns forever. Once, all that mattered was what a candidate said. Now, it mattered just as much how he looked while he was saying it. During the first debate, John Kennedy looked relaxed, fit, and charismatic. Richard Nixon looked uncomfortable, swarthy, and nervous as he sweated under the hot lights. Kennedy also looked much younger, even though Nixon was only four years older than he. In content, the debate was almost a draw. The performances of the candidates were evenly matched. In the end, it was not necessary for John Kennedy to win the debate on the issues. It was enough that he looked like he belonged on the same stage with Richard Nixon. He did. When Americans went to the polls on November 8, 1960, no great issues divided the candidates. Both men advocated strong missile defense against the Soviet threat. Kennedy was as anti-communist as Nixon. Both opposed its expansion, including in Cuba, an island 90 miles off the coast of Florida, and both saw the Soviet Union as a dangerous rival. Neither candidate was then at the forefront of the civil rights movement. Voters chose between the personalities of the two men as much as they did between the issues. Kennedy presented himself as the voice of a new generation who would get the country moving again toward a new frontier. Nixon argued that he, not Kennedy, had the proven leadership experience to guide the nation in a dangerous world. Out of 68.3 million votes cast, John Kennedy received only about 119,450 more votes than Richard Nixon. Nixon had lost the presidency by just two-tenths of one percent of the popular vote. It was one of the closest elections in history. Late into the night, neither man knew who had won. 
Not until the morning after the election was Kennedy declared the winner.